Please help me welcome Dale Graff. Okay. Dale, you're on. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'll borrow a term from Jerome Clark and say that I'm going to be examining various uh, unusual experiences. Some of them are anomalous and some of them are paranormal. Anyway, what I'm going to be looking at is examining a, different, a variety of experiences to see if there are any common features between them. I'm, I'm going to be looking to see if there's a side connection, that is ESP, telepathy, uh, remote viewing that might exist amongst the different experiences. I'm going to be taking a look at the lucid dream out of body spectrum and the implications that might come from this. My first connection with anomalous phenomenon occurred when I was assigned to the Foreign Technology Division in 1964 and through a fortuitous coincidence I was sitting right next to the Project Blue Book office and that gave me an opportunity to sample some of the cases that they had in the file. I only could look through several hundred of the many thousands they had there so I can't really come up with a definitive conclusion um, unlike some of the other committees that looked at the same data but I will say this, that I think of all the data that are recorded, or that were recorded in Project Blue Book, and I'll go along with the assessment made by Major Quintanilla, who was the chief at the time, that at least 10%, if not more, are totally unexplained. We just can't even rationalize what may have caused them. At, while I was at FTD, I had the uh, opportunity to sit next to the uh, UFO hotline phone, which was um, in, an, in the office next to me. And occasionally I would be brought in to help evaluate the calls that were called in from the general public. And through the years that I was sitting there and occasionally looking at some of these reports, I have to say I did not see any that were credible. They were usually hoaxes or misinterpretations of actual data. Nevertheless, uh, I think there are at least 10 percent of the cases in that file that are truly unexplainable. What was disappointing to me was that the data was rather limited. There were a lot of questions I had, but I couldn't really get into it. Um, and for example, there were incidents of out-of-body experiences described. There were unusual physiological effects, and you've heard about some of them here. Some of the people that had these sightings reported spontaneous healings afterwards. Some of them had increased sensitivities, like when individuals report a near-death experience. And of course, there's ample examples of psi phenomenon in there. But I also noticed in the cases I looked at, and also with people that I met in the community, and began exploring this with people locally in the Dayton, Ohio area, that some of the experiencers had trauma in their lives, either past, even present, or some future trauma. And I have examples later. My interest sort of died off about 1968 when I was transferred to Hickam Air Force Base and I lost interest in the field um, until um, I had a near drowning experience in Hawaiian surf. And when, when I came back from that experience, I found that the boundaries that I had between consciousness and awake had totally dissolved. I was able to go directly from the awake state into the dream state without ever going to sleep. So suddenly I become aware of being in a dream. And years later I learned that there's a yoga technique called dream yoga where they spend years trying to achieve that particular ability. So this gave me an opportunity to study lucid dreams and the out-of-body experience in great detail. I located people in the community that could do the same. And as we worked with this material, I found there was a lot of archetypal material in there. For those familiar with C.G. Jung and the collective unconscious, you'll know what I mean. Uh, but it's basically symbols that don't have a personal connection, that go back in time historic, in, into ancient myths, mythology, whatever. Um, and I also experienced a lot of archetypal and symbolic dreams, but they had to do with the symbols, ground symbols, discs and whatever, which I associated with um, like the mandala, uh, a symbol of connectedness to my subconscious mind. And integration was going on between my consciousness and my subconsciousness. As I worked with people, I found that we actually shared all our mutual dreams, whether we wanted to or not. And we experienced a lot of telepathy and precognition. This is during the time frame in the early 1970s when I started to take a deep look at this. One of the interesting things that I found was that those of us that were really looking at dreams would sometimes wake up and there was a dream image still in the room. Had it not been for the fact that we remembered a dream, we would have said that was an apparition or a ghost. And this dream image that remained as we woke up momentarily 
could be frightening if we didn't know we had a dream. Could be a, a person, an animal, or a thing. There were also times when we had false awakenings. You know, you wake up into a dream, you think you're awake, but you're not. I'm not sure how to get rid of that symbol. Um, we also experience sleep analysis, uh, sleep paralysis, where there are times you wake up and you're totally paralyzed. You can't move. It's a very unsettling experience. And during this time, we also found that as we worked with dreams, our waking imagery was very clear. And as we experimented with different projects, we found that it was very easy to go from a dream state to a conscious state, particularly when we were trying to describe remote scenes or pictures that were concealed. Another thing that I found was that the more intense you became, the more intense intensity or intentionality that you put into the success of the project, the experiment, the more vivid the imagery. And here's where I made some mistakes early on. Some of my target material was far too emotional, and the individual on the other end, the receiving end of the dream, or their waking state experience would end up with severe physical symptoms. In some cases, a picture of somebody being stabbed by a sword would convert directly to a black and blue mark on the arm of the individual. Um, because we had actually got, maybe spent too much energy in trying to connect with that distant target. I know I had an experience one time in a double blind where the picture was a holocaust, somebody being injected with poison. And I, I woke up from a horrible dream, actually thinking I was dying. I went to the bathroom, sick, and it took me a 10 minutes to get over that sickness. So it's possible to really get absorbed into the target material and take on the physical symptoms, even to the point we actually see the marks. Now, I've also been aware of the staring experiments. These are mild compared to some of the more intense physiological ones that I've experienced with my colleagues over the years. I was a participant in the SRI. Um, staring experiment. I was in Russia in 1993 and observed the Russian experiment in a similar uh, project of staring, which was actually more intense than the one we did in this country. Now, I've explored the experiences. I have three here that are really uh, the intense ones over the 10 year period that I really looked at this. One was the alien threat. A woman contacted me and said that there was an alien, a gray, coming into her bedroom, which shape shifted and looked like an evil demon. Well, the more I talked to her, the more I realized this sounded more like an archetype or something, some kind of threat. Um, together, we worked on the mutual dreaming, and we were able to identify that this alien was actually the face. It shape-shifted into the face of somebody that threatened her many years ago. And we wondered why uh, the dream occurred now when it turned out that he had call he called her a couple of days later, so she was then prepared to deal with the approaching threat. There were two other traumas that I worked with at this time, the people in the community, that had to do with poltergeist phenomenon. And in one case, we identified the source of the outbreak with a traumatic incident that happened in a woman's childhood when her mother tried to suffocate her. And whenever her mother's birthday came around, she had um, this poltergeist outbreak where objects flew around the room in her house. In another case, it was a future trauma where the woman experienced poltergeistry of a trauma that she would learn about the next day. Now, in all the work I've done over the years, I've been looking at different experiences that meditators, uh, people that are going into fasting, um, people that experience the kundalini phenomenon, which sometimes occurs through meditation. Uh, I've talked to epileptics, people have seizures. Uh, I've talked to synesthetic people uh, suffering from crossed senses, a whole host of people that have different kinds of experiences. And these are some of the common experiences they, re they report. It's a rotating, spinning feeling, their tunnels, their vortexes, their tubes they get drawn into, their strong electric and magnetic sensations, their color shifts going from a vivid gray to a blue that they perceive visually. Uh, the geometric forms, triangles, squares, shapes that condense and form different shapes. And when we're doing experiments, these shapes generally correlate with the intended target. And of course, there are sounds, humming, buzzing, or there are silences. Now, you might look at that and say, well, that sounds like some of the UFO experiences, and that's correct, too. So I'm pointing out that these experiences can occur at other kinds of situations. Now, sometimes in order to look at boundaries of perception, um, working with a colleague that lives in Orlando, Florida, I like to use very simple projects like this eye test chart. 
Um, so the page from this optical book is on the left, is target. This is her response on the right, which actually correlates very well with the vertical lines, except it shifts. And that was the whole intention of the eye test, to shift from one spot to the other. Uh, but then, like in most remote viewing situations, she turns this into an animal or a farce. So the, the tendency to analyze is ever present. Um, here was the same project, only in a dream state. And in this case, the lines are very close to correlating with the intended target. But again, there's a shift into interpreting, and which, are, which in this case, there's no interpretation. They're just pure lines. Um, I like to work with the future. And my specialty, you might say, is trying to perceive the pictures that appear on newspapers three days in the future, three or five days in the future. And th these are two pictures that appeared on a local newspaper three days after the dream. And I always sketch the ending of the dream, which is the most reliable and the most accurate. There were two pictures on that page, the one on top and then the one on the bottom. The, the event had not occurred at the time of the dream. The event occurred three days later, or two days later, and was published three days later. On the top, you will notice that this doesn't really look like the picture, but it was a sense of falling it was a sense of something like a parachute, uh, some kind of moisture coming down, and it, it captured the essence, the dynamics of the picture, um, including some very specific details of the shadow, the shadow that's right below the dog, uh, that light dark pattern. In this case, the accuracy was off, but the, the timing seemed to be on in terms of the momentum. On the bottom picture, the timing is off, but the accuracy of the picture is better because I have to presume that the dog actually did catch that in the next frame. Remember, these pictures did not exist at the time of the dream. Um, the event occurred three days later. So there's a slight hint of an uncertainty principle here. Accurate in time, uh, trade-off in position. Accurate in position, trade-off in time. I've seen this over the years in some of the projects I worked on. I like this one. It's a painting of a Peruvian shaman um, after uh, one of his shamanic journeys uh, at drinking the brew Arhuska, I think I pronounced that right, with the drug DMT, and I don't quite know how to pronounce it, dimethyl triphetamine. Now, in this, what's interesting here is the center top is a spacecraft. That's what he describes as a spacecraft. And those are aliens or people that inhabit that spacecraft that come out to meet him. Uh, there's a lot of cultural stuff, there's a lot of archetypal stuff uh, in here as well. But Peruvian shamans tend to have a tendency to see UFOs. So if you want to see a UFO, I suppose you should go to the Amazon. So what have I come to after all these years? I think that some UFOs are internal imagery, and they're generated totally by the individual. This could be some kind of an archetypal, archetypal thing. It could be something from the collective unconscious. It could be some kind of buried hidden need that the individual has to have the experience. There are also some from terrestrial sources. You might be in a position, a position or close to a high power magnetic field or electromagnetic uh, radar uh, generation that might generate some of these. But even more significant, some of these can be transferred from one person to another by intention. I know a lot of cases where somebody sees UFOs when somebody who has good psychic abilities say, look up in the sky, there's a UFO, and they see them. But they don't all see the same thing. So there's a transfer, and I think in the Hindu tradition, you call that Shakti, the transfer of energy, the transfer of imagery. In the abductions, I tend to think that a lot of them, if not most of them, are lucid dreams, out-of-body experiences, or the one that's really more vivid than others, the transpersonal one. And I believe that many of them have trauma links, and some of them might be linked to the drug DMT, which is some researchers suspect is generated by the pineal, pineal plan. And of course, some are unexplainable, and you've heard a lot about that so far. Implications? I think that there really is a collective imaginal domain that does have an existence. It's real in a psychological sense, but not in a literal sense. It somehow has a reality all to itself. I also suspect now that space-time is represented somewhere. There's a representation of space-time, a counterpart somewhere that's like holo a holographic pattern. Uh, which can record and also code information in space-time. And that through our conscious, subconscious mind, we can interact with it, providing the needs and the intentions are focused properly. Sometimes it's a subconscious thing, sometimes it's an intentional thing, a planned thing, like in remote viewing, for example. 
And um, I also think at this stage that the two biggest problems of psi in terms of trying to reconcile it from a scientific point of view are precognition and macro PK. And if you think about space-time being represented in some represent representational space, then I'm beginning to think that precognition is a projection feature of that space-time. So that what we perceive as the future is not really in the future, but it's now and projected from all known information that's in this representational space. Macro PK then follows, because now with the representational space, then it's a matter of somehow interacting with the forms, the energy forms, whatever, that are in the representational space and changing them around and then uh, quitting or then uh, leaving the experience or changing the shapes. And of course, I think it's also important to keep in mind that insights from individual experiences are important, but keeping in mind that each one has a different sensing and a different interpretation, which totally changes uh, from individual to individual. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Someone got through. Questions on the yeah. side? All right. Questions? Okay, questions. Did I see a hand? Here's one in the back. This, my question or, or observation addresses but a small part of what you uh, illustrated. The, um, the point that connected for me both in terms of your <clears throat> near-death experience and the, the wounding that sometimes appears following a, a traumatic uh, night inside your town uh, suggested Ian Stevens' work with uh, past life uh, uh, carryover, uh, for, for instance, if there was a traumatic death and some I injury had occurred to a part of the body in the process, that, the, that birthmarks would show up on people uh, in, in sessions where they were uh, re-examining this material. And if, the, if, the, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, then the dream state between lives might not be that different from that uh, between uh, the nighttime and daytime uh, for allowing for that kind of a transmission. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I think you're right on in that. Um, and whatever, I use the term imaginal or collective unconscious, but you can add other terms to that, some kind of transitional stage or phase, some, some non-reality domain, but yet it's very real. No, I can relate to that, and I think there's something to it, there's something to your concept there. Yes. Uh, Dave, I got a question, that picture that you had uh, from Peru. Yeah. I th believe the substance they're using is ayahuasca. Yeah, this, it's Having dealt stuff. with the uh, curanderos there, found that the, when you talk to them, we talk about separate states mm -hmm. of consciousness, and you've talked about waking and sleep. Mm -hmm. When you talk with the curanderos, it's like these states are contiguous. I mean, they just move mm -hmm. smoothly between them. I just wonder if you could comment on, you know, wh why is it we have a distinct separation? They see no separation at all and seem to move fluidly. Yes, the uh, practice shaman apparently does that. You know, I sometimes wonder if they would need to indulge in any kind of brew. Uh, but uh, the beginners, the, the apprentices, appear to be able to uh, need that thing. So uh, what the shamans in Peru and other places do is very similar to the dream yoga approach from Tibet and, and that part of the country, uh, different terms. But the ultimate goal is to have this continuous awareness, whether you're so-called asleep or not, you know, well, the continuous one last, awareness. One last question. I wonder if you could put back that diagram, that colored diagram from uh, the one with the UFOs, the color that you showed the, uh, um, I guess it's a shaman one. Yeah. One. Can you put it back on the screen, Sure, please? if I can get back there quickly enough. <coughs> okay, you want to go to the shaman art? Yeah, I guess, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yes. Well, you see those angels with the many faces? That yeah. is reminiscent of Ezekiel's vision of the Merkava. That's exactly it with all the uh, four or three faces okay. that he describes in the Bible. Well, again, oh, yes, that may well be, but I think it's, it also reflects on the collective unconscious that no matter what culture you're in, you are going to access 
shapes, forms, configurations, what certain people look like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't doubt that. It's, it's very similar. What is the collective unconscious? But a storehouse of that kind of imagery, whether it has a religious tone, and I think some UFO experiences are really religious experiences disguised in modern technology and vice versa. So it's really hard to draw that, that distinction. Thank you, Dale Grant. Okay.